Uh, yeah, we're just getting started. <laughs> and so I believe that God is going to provide every resource that we need, and he's going to help us to further this movement. Um, Dr. Brown, Dr. Amos Brown, he is the co-chair of the California Reparations Task Force. And he's also the pastor of Third Baptist Church and the president of the NAACP San Francisco branch. And so I want you all to give a big round of applause, a warm round of applause for this man of God. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for being here with us today. But I'm not able to be there with you in person. I am a big hat over our fair share of love dealing with social justice issues here in San Francisco. And let me say parenthetically at the outset, we are very happy to connect with our old friend. Now, do you believe it, over half a century, Dr. Chuck Singleton. And many of us across this country who've been in the prophetic tradition of ministry have always been encouraged by the present prophetic utterances and more important, the downright decency that resides in his frame. He epitomizes love supreme church that he passed it as sweet Dana Grace indicated years ago tangibilitation of the gospel many people talk about the gospel preach about it they sing about it they shout about it but they don't know how to make it tangible reincarnated in us. I secondly would like to commend all of those of you who gather around the round table in order that we might reason together to what Isaiah at first chapter says. Come, let us reason together. This nation, I contend, from the very beginning, has lost its mind. And to use the words of my teacher, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, when he was about to preach the last sermon on this earth, has scribbled some notes with the title of that sermon. He never preached. Will America go to hell? Will America go to hell? Well, let me submit to you this day. We were not talking about that physical hell. Dr. King was talking about, not talking about a physical hell. But that state of being growing us damnable and downright I contend that our situation may be like the times when we have a breakdown of our car vehicle. Those who are fortunate enough to have AAA know that you are surely going to making it home or to your destination anyhow. Because you have a little card in your possession. A triple A card. We all know that whatever you call triple A. The person who asks says, among other things, are you in a safe space? Are you in a safe space? You will answer. Yes, I know. But I contend today 
that America is not in a safe space. We are in a dangerous, ruinous, divisive, evil space. Why? Because we don't know how to be good anymore in recent times. But historically, we were not good to each other. Let me take you way back. The 4th century B.C., before America supposedly was discovered by, we are told, erroneously one Christopher Columbus. During the 4th century B.C., my friend, Aristotle, one of Great minds, so we say, of Western thought, said in his politics, and I quote him, you can Google it when you go home. In the politics, Aristotle said, black man of the Ethiopian is inferior because his skin is dark. He went on to say, among other things, the only way we could become somebody and be a part of the human family, we would have to go way up out of climate Europe and become like. Second, the insane thing that he said was that we would never be capable of self-government. We would never be capable of self-government, I repeat. But then we would always have to have white man or white woman over us. End of the quote. What does this give root and a basis for? I submit to you words of Jim Wallace, my friend. America was infected with that original sin, and that sin. Racism, bigotry, and being mean as hell to black folks because of the color of our skin. That's why Western European power, France, Belgium, England, Spain, went down to Mother Africa and saw us as potential tools, tools, not human beings, but tools. For their comfort, for their white entitlement, and for them to be on their seats of power and authority. If for no other reason, this topic that you're dealing with today, reparation, it is right. Talk about it. Right on. Do something about it. And understand that America must do three things. We're going to get out of this unsafe space. It's about to destroy us of being enslaved to racism, to that original sin of being mean as hell, black folk. Well, let's take letter A, number one. This nation has got to admit, admit that it did a wrong, an egregious wrong. And that's where we are now, in an unsafe space. You got that man down there in Florida, standing now, talking the foolish about something he didn't know and think about. Critical race theory. What is critical race theory? There's no booger man. It is an exercise to bring the world to the truth, the truism, that there was this bad treatment of us, taking us to, because man named Aristotle said that we were not human and were not to be in charge of our own self-government 
and destiny. That's why they are right now telling all the lies about what should be taught in school. Do you know right now there in California just last week, just last week I repeat, that was sent out to the school form letter ask the parents is it all right for your child to learn if they're the boys and sing? That great hymn that came from a poem that won James Paul Dunst, that great intellect and scholar who was president, executive director of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, the first black president. He wrote that poem, 1900 was the anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. And on that day, 1900, at Stanton School, he was principal. He decided that on the occasion they were honoring the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and also great Booker T. Washington was the principal speaker. That he would not give a functionary introduction Oh, uh, but he wrote a poem. That poem was about the struggles of black folk, about how we made it when hope unborn had died, how we made it and showed the world that we had thought and we had dignity and we had soul, and we had love. Just think about it. In our time, in 2023, you have an evil, white, Hispanic man who's leading a movement to say you can't know the truth about what happened to black folk. And consequently, ever you have that kind of a mentality of foot in a society, you're on your way to becoming a fast state. Many people wouldn't listen years ago. And when Donald Trump got out there, being the mouthpiece for this movement, they would not listen. You come to the point. Right now, people are still in a state of denial and won't admit evil of racism. Separate but united six years. Sometimes benign neglect. You can't have heaven, you can't have peace when you don't tell the truth. Remember, Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free. So, first A is to Admit, admit, and stop being like a drug addict in a state of denial, not dealing with reality. America must come to the truth and admit our wrong, being complicit in that slave trade that brought our ancestors to this land against our will. Secondly, you got that card, that other way it means. It means atonement. Atonement. What is atonement? Oh, you can find it, brothers and sisters. In that 19th chapter of St. Luke, I don't have time to expand on. Do you remember the experience of a man named Zacchaeus? Jesus because of the crowd or how he got up in that tree because he was elevated he had the right vision of Jesus Jesus told him to come down and go home with him. he got home they sat down and talked Jesus got into his business and old demons after he admitted his wrong as a 
tax collector after he had admitted his wrong as a publican, after he had admitted his wrong of being complicit with wrong and taking poor, living a road life. You know the story goes. He said, Master, if I have wrong in I make a man. I atone. And if I have unjustly treated anybody by taking some money from them that I shouldn't have taken with those taxes, I'm going to pay back for all. That is, my brothers and sisters, reparation. That is the book. So, I prejudice the state. Now, after we have said we're going to atone, finally, that a uh, act, act, you don't make no wrong paralysis analysis. You don't engage in 2 dB equated. Everybody hear me? You don't engage in repeated analysis. You act and do something about it. So now is the time. America, for the state, and for your city and my city. Hey, is anybody there? Act. You know what I mean? And pay back. Uh, chat or... Well, that's it. We have questions, comments, we will today. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. We honor you today. You are the epitome of what we want to be. You are the example for us, and we will do our level best to follow in your footsteps and carry this spiritual message across this world as the Lord will allow us. Thank you so much. Ooh. Chris Lodgson. Uh, when we were in Atlanta for our summit, you would have thought he, you know, was at the uh, uh, Oscars or something. He took away so many statues for his work around reparations. Uh, I'm so honored to know him and to be able to work alongside him. He is the lead organi organizer with CJEC the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, and AR ARCC, the American Redress Coalition of California, which are grassroots California-based organizations working for reparations and reparative justice for descendants of U.S. chattel slavery living in California. CJEC is one of seven community organizations selected by the California Reparations Task Force to conduct community outreach and engagement for reparations. Put your hands together. My brother, Mr. Chris Lodgson. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can I take this mic out? Is that, is that okay? Yeah? Cool. Everybody's so much taller than me. Oh my goodness. Uh, first of all, put your hands together for yourselves, please. All right. Put your hands together for yourselves. And I may actually start to move around so camera people tell me if that messes up the shadow or not. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple things that I was specifically asked to talk about. And I'm not going to show any slides. Okay. I want you to focus on what I'm saying, the sound of my voice. Okay. I'm going to talk about the California Reparations Report a little bit. I'm going to talk about some of the other work that CJEC is doing around reparations and what we call reparative justice, so stuff related to reparations. My brother Chad talked about one of those things. I'm going to talk about one other of those things. But before I do any of that, and while also I'm doing some of that, I'm going to tell you three stories 
three stories today. I'm going to start with my own story. By the way, I'm also going to, I, I didn't plan on doing this. I have my own notes over there. I'm going to go back to the notes in a minute. But I'm also going to give you a just very basic level understanding of the California Reparations Task Force. You've heard a lot today about legislation and bill numbers and this work and a lot of great stuff that's going on. I was in a meeting yesterday with the mayor of Sacramento and some folks, including Betty Williams, who runs the Sacramento NAACP. And one thing she said to me was, you got to break it down to where the people can understand it. You got to meet people, people where they are. And you got to give people a basic level understanding of what's going on. So I'm also going to do that. I'm going to try to slip that in there in the brief time that I have. But first, I'm going to tell you a story. I'll tell you my own story. So my family knows this. My folks know this. As was sort of mentioned in my bio, I, and you won't hear this, and you probably already hear it. I'm originally from New York City. I was born and raised in Manhattan, Brooklyn. Been in California for about since, about, since about 2015. I got my organizing start working inside of New York City homeless shelters. Okay. I was working inside of New York City homeless shelters while I was living in the shelters. While I was living in the shelters, I would be, I lived on the ninth floor with six other guys. We would go downstairs to the lunch line and to the dinner line. And it was so bad in there. At a certain point, I said, yo, like, we got to change some things in here. And I didn't know nothing about organizing. I didn't know nothing about community work. I didn't know nothing about nothing. Nothing. But I had seen somebody do something called a petition before. And so I got a piece of paper. I got a pen. And I drew a line like this. I drew a line like this. I put name on this side, signature on this side. And I went down to the lunch line and I said, brother, I know you know what's going on in here. The food is horrible. I lost 30 pounds since I've been in here. The, the police kicking the doors in the middle of the night. People getting in fights. There's no security in here. They treat you like you a criminal for being poor. Put your name here, sign here. If we get enough people on it, I'm going to go take it to the boss of this place and say, listen, 100 people, 1,000 people say, let's change it. Within the first two days, we had page after page after page after page of people with their name and their signature saying some things got to change in here. That was my start. Right on, right on. That was my start in the organizing work. Now, I eventually moved on to do other things and eventually became somebody who got hired by one of the nonprofits that worked inside of the New York City homeless shelters. And I'm very, very grateful for that work that I was able to do right before coming out here to California. I want to start there with my story. Remember, three stories. I also want to, and, 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 you know, probably should have started here, but I do really want to thank Nita. Okay? I drove down here from Sacramento. <laughs> I left at 2.55 in the morning, this morning. Okay? Drove all the way down here. I had to be here. I could have jumped on the Zoom. I had to be here, though. I really want to show up for you, Nita. Because okay? you have showed up for us so many times. So many times. And I had to make sure that I was here in person to give you back that love. So thank you, Nita. Also, thank you to my colleagues at the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California. Man. So CJEC, as we call ourselves, we are a coalition of organizations, associations, regular black folks, as we like to call ourselves, who got involved for reparations. Right now, we are California's first and only, so far as we know, first and only statewide organization born for reparations. That's all we do. That's all we do. Reparations and what we call reparative justice, so stuff related to reparations, which one of those things I'm going to talk about in a minute in my third story, and one of those things my brother Chad talked about earlier, which is making sure that our country sees us as a specific group of people. I don't know if you understand how, or yet understand how important the words that my brother Chad spoke were earlier. 
about the need for our government to see us as a specific group of people. I was talking earlier, I think I was talking to, the, to Chad and to the council member. Yes, that matters for reparations work, yes. Those who will be eligible for reparations are those who are descendants of US slavery. Great, yes, right. That's the right thing to do. But even outside of the reparations work, we deserve that as a people. We deserve as a people to be recognized by our government, especially the people that built this country. I, I said this, I think I said this in some testimony to the task force at some point in public comment rather. We've been here, here 400 names, it's a damn shame we don't have a name. Excuse me, we've been here 400 years, it's a damn shame we don't have a name. Our country has not seen us as a specific group of people almost ever. And that's changing now. So stuff related to reparations is also stuff that we work on. And I'm gonna talk more about that in my third story, as I mentioned. But as I get started here, again, thanks to CJAC. CJAC, again, is a coalition of groups. So I wanna shout out our groups by name. I believe in recognizing groups and, and folks that are actually working by name. So first, the American Redress Coalition of California in Sacramento. The American Redress Coalition of California in the Bay Area the California Black Lineage Society, and of course, the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants in Los Angeles. I mean, it's, you know, I don't take people's time for granted. I don't take people's energy for granted. And to see people, I think my brother Marcus here said it, we just regular people who decided to, we, 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 we not professionals. We not, we wasn't trained to, to do none of this. We just said, something is wrong, we gotta do something about it, and we're not taking no for an answer. And whatever we gotta learn, we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn by trying. We're gonna make mistakes here and there, but we're gonna keep going in the right direction. So I wanted to start with some thank yous. I mean, I, I really think it's important to recognize your power. Your power. Right? Your power. It's important to recognize what you can do, what you can accomplish in two years, three years, four years, at most. We have our names and our hand in two of the most important pieces of legislation for black Californians, probably in California history. In four years max of work, that is the law that created the California Reparations Task Force, language, a law that we have language in, and as my brother Chad talked about, the law that makes our government see us specifically as a specific group of people. That's just a, a, a sample of what you can do. Just a piece of what we could do. Okay, let me get to my stuff here. Okay. So, today, uh, as mentioned, I was I've been asked to talk up to you about the California Reparations Task Force's first report, and I'm gonna to get to that, and some of the harms against black American descendants of US chattel slavery, but, so, some of the things I'm gonna tell you, you may not have heard, but you know what it's like for our people. I mean, you live it, and we could just go outside. You know what our people going through, what we going through, what you personally are going through. You know it. But I am gonna talk a little bit about what the California Reparations Task Force has discovered and uncovered about the way that our lives are being lived. I'm also gonna to talk to you about, in my third story, as I mentioned, the other type of work that we do around reparative justice, so stuff related to reparations, so there's reparations and then reparative justice means to us stuff related to reparations. I'm also gonna talk to you about the fight that we're in right now to end current slavery going on in California state prisons. Okay. Right now. Okay. So, so I'm maybe I'm. This is in my later notes. So I'm gonna say it now, anyways. I just 
got to say it now. Some of us don't know. And, and by the way, also shout out to the folks watching on, on Zoom right now, watching live. Appreciate y'all. Thank you for being here virtually. Thank you. Please mute your mics. Okay, Stay on mute. All right. <laughs> Stay on mute, please. Stay on mute. Okay. <laughs> so some of us know and some don't know that you can be enslaved right now in the state of California. Our state, and so how, right? So our state constitution, just like our federal constitution, has that comma in there somewhere. And here's where it matters. So somewhere in there it says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude are allowed, comma, except as punishment for crime. That is in our state constitution right now. It's also in our national federal constitution under the 13th Amendment. Some of y'all seen the documentary called 13. That's all what that's about. California has its own version of that. You can be enslaved right now as punishment for a crime. So I'm going to talk about our work to end current slavery going on right now. But before I do any of that, I want to locate us in time. And after I do that, I want to share with you some words that you may already know, some you may not know, but words nonetheless that I think are important to say. So where are we, where are you in time right now? So stop what you're doing. Well, everybody, stop what you're doing. Look at me. Right now, every single one of you, every single one of us, is sitting and living inside of a history book. Every single one of you is living, sitting, breathing, eating, inside of a history book. Why? People are going to be reading and writing and talking about what you did about what I did, about what we did now for reparations five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. Right now, we are closer to reparations than we've ever been as a people. Literally, closer, thank you, brother, closer to reparations than we've ever been. <clears throat> Again, fittingly, in this Black History Month, we are living and writing black reparations history right now. But, let me take this out with me. What will it say about us, though? What will history say about us? Now, what will it say about you? What will it say about me? What will history say about us now? Will it say, when you learned and became aware that you answered the call of history? Will it say, when you learned and became aware that you rose to the occasion. Some familiar words, as I promised. And if thy brother, a Hebrew man, or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee, and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year, thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, Thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy wine press of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondsman in the land of Egypt and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. 
Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. Now, these are the words of God as spoken to the prophets, of course, in Deuteronomy. I think you know and have heard some of those familiar words. But there, there are some unfamiliar words that you may or may not be familiar with. Quote, we use black power to create white guilt. My approach is biblical. How can I ask my heavenly father to forgive me if I can't forgive my brother? On reparations, I feel it continues to let us know that we're still African-American and rather than just American. Reparations or atonement, it's outside of the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, anybody know who said those last words? Close? No. <laughs> Closer? No. <laughs> Close to, <laughs> nope, close, very close. Those, so those are the words of none other than Herschel Walker. Eh? Everybody was very close. Eh? Uh, who just lost, just lost his try to be the U.S. Senator from Georgia. Herschel Walker spoke those words saying, again, I quote, reparations or atonement is outside of the teaching of Jesus Christ. He uttered those words, and this is serious, in front of the entire country, on national TV, in testimony to the United States House of Representatives at the most recent H.R. 40 reparations hearings, I believe in 2020. In front of the whole country, he told the whole country, and this should make you mad as believers, that reparations is outside of God's teaching. So as angry and as furious as these words made me and no doubt make you, I still and do take comfort, comfort in the words of the Lord, who says, <laughs> fools mock at reparations, <laughs> but among the upright there's favor. Okay? So, all right, let me, let me move forward here a little bit. I don't want to take too much time. I want to talk about the California Reparations Task Force's first report. Let's slide this here for a second. Let's start with the story. By the way, well, I'll get to that in a second. So I'm just going to pull from the book here. Oh, sorry. By the way, this is a physical copy of the California Reparations Task Force's first report. Okay. This is it right here. Okay. 500 pages-ish. Okay. 500 is pages. I told people, yo, I, I don't think I had ever read nothing 500 pages ever. And I want to give a shout out to C-Jack and to the folks who work with us at our media partner, ETM Media Group, who spent really the last half of last year reading each one of these chapters live on social media to members of the public. We, uh, I did a, a weekly reading of each chapter on Twitter Spaces. And we would have a, about an hour and a half of reading, and then we would talk about what we read for about an hour. And our friends at ETM Media Group did a marathon read of this report on YouTube. And the video is on YouTube now. So if you want to listen to somebody read this report to you, that is available to you now at ETM Media Group. Yes, please do clap for ETM Media Group. They, they are special, special people. I want to give a a uh, big shout out to my brother, uh, Pastor Francis here, who, you know, I think great minds think alike. Okay. Second story. Okay. So I'm reading from the California Reparations Task Force first report, chapter one, the introduction, page 33, called California Stories. Consider the short family. In December 1945, Old Day Short, his wife Helen, their seven-year-old daughter Carol Ann, and their nine-year-old son Barry moved into a house that they had built in Fontana, California. In 1945, Fontana was a white neighborhood. Deputy sheriffs warned Short that he was, quote, out of bounds, and that to avoid, quote, disagreeableness. Short should move his family back to the segregated black neighborhood on, quote, the other side of the baseline. 
The real estate agent who sold the property to the Shorts warned them on December 3rd, 1945, that a, quote, vigilante committee had a meeting on your case last night, Mr. Short. They are a tough bunch to deal with, he said. If I were you, I'd get my family off this property at once. On December 6th, two weeks after they moved in, an explosion and fire engulfed the house. Neighbors reported seeing Helen trying to beat down the flames consuming her children. Helen, Carol Ann, and Barry died in the hospital, burned to death. The San Bernardino County coroner and district attorney concluded that the explosion was an accident. The district attorney based this conclusion partly on a statement given by O'Day while he was in the hospital. During the same conversation, O'Day also said, quote, I am here on my sick bed. My hair burned off my head. My legs twisted under me. You have no respect for my position. All you want to do is get the information you're looking for. The district attorney told O'Day that his wife and two young children had died when doctors had been keeping the information from him for fear that his condition would worsen. O'Day himself died a few days later. A subsequent California Attorney General report investigating the murders concluded that no evidence of vigilante activity in Fontana could be found. Every one of you should have one of these. It should be, it was, I think, attached to your program. These are our California reparations information cards. We take them pretty much everywhere we go. If you want some of these, please send us an email at cjackofficial at gmail.com. We'll get you some basic California reparations information. I'm going to give you a, just a quick basic here. Maybe, hope that, hopefully I can do this in two to three minutes. And they'll tell me if I'm going too long. I want to give you some background on the California Reparations Task Force and the report that I just read from. So, in 2020, our current governor, Gavin Newsom, signed a piece of legislation. We've been calling it AB 3121, Assembly Bill 3121. The number of the bill doesn't matter as much as the fact that the governor signed a law that created what is now a nine-member task force, and you see all nine members of the task force here on this information card. You have one here in the house with you, and you just heard from Dr. Brown. You heard from the chair earlier, and you heard from the co-chair just before me. Nine members on a California reparations task force or a group of people whose job it is to do three things. These nine people have to do three things, and they have two years to do it. The first thing they have to do, these nine people, is study slavery with a specific focus on what California is guilty for. That's the first thing. The second thing these nine people have to do is educate the public about what it learns. The third thing these people have to do is create a plan for reparations. They have two years to do those three things. Two years from the day they started working to do those three things. As it says here on the card, the task force started in 2021, June of 2021. So June of 2021 plus two years means until June or the end of June of 2023. This year, that means this year in the summer, the final reparations plan will be released publicly with the reparations plans in it. So Chair Moore spoke about the five forms of reparations, compensation. That's the money part. I say it all the time, but if it doesn't have compensation, it ain't reparations to me. Restitution, the return of land and or property, etc. Rehabilitation, what you might think of as the non-financial stuff, so free education, free health care, etc., free legal services. Guarantees of non-repetition or protections, as I like to think about them. Change the laws and the policies to make sure what happened to us never happens again. And satisfaction, some of the things that we think of as satisfaction doesn't mean being satisfied. It means 
things like a public apology, changing our history and our textbooks to make sure that they tell the actual truth, taking down racist landmarks and putting up our stuff instead, things like that. Five forms of reparations. The task force, as I mentioned, has two years to do those three things and release a final plan as the third thing in July or June of this year. But what happens after that plan is released, though? Like, it's, it doesn't mean, like, the reparations happen in June or July, do they? No. That plan then gets sent to the governor, to the state senate, to the state assembly, to then write into legislation to become a California reparations bill and hopefully law. When is the earliest we can expect to see something like that? So, July, June or Ju July of this year, plan comes out. That's already too late in the year to do any new bills or new laws. Every year there's a deadline after which you can't do any new laws. So that's already too late. So the earliest we will see any California reparations legislation or bills that we want to become law is sometime this excuse me sometime around this time next year. So early 2024. Just just to just to make it simple. Early 2024 is the earliest I expect that we will see a reparations bill which will have the five forms of actual reparations in it with an actual price tag on it, with how much and how much of what, and as we've heard about, for who. Okay. Two things to highlight, and I'm going back to the report, and then I'm going to end on my last story. So the task force, the state reparations task force, did two very important things last year. The first thing it did, I think, was very, very important was what some of my family already talked about, which was decide who would be eligible for reparations in California. As Chair Moore said, I think my, my brother Marcus said also, who else are you going to be talking about but the descendants of U.S. slavery? I mean, if we're talking about reparations for slavery, who else are you going to be talking about? Who else matters? So it's a moral right or wrong thing first. Uh, you know, there's some other arguments for it too, right? I think the, the other most important thing to say, and I'll just sort of re-say what my family said, which is that in California, legally and what we call constitutionally, we have to write legislation in a way that doesn't violate the law and violate the Constitution. If your reparations legislation says anybody who checks a box and says they're black gets it, it's almost certainly illegal and will not happen. There won't be no reparations if that's what it says. The other important thing that the task force did in its first year was release this first re report. Very, very important re report. If you want to get an online copy of this report, go to our website, www.cjec-official.org. And as soon as you get on the home page, like in the first three seconds, you'll, you'll get a pop-up, and then it'll take you, it'll, it'll, it'll say, read the first reparations report, and then you can click the link, and it'll take you right there. Okay. My third story, and I'm going to close here. As mentioned, CJEC works on reparations and reparative justice, so stuff related to reparations. We've talked about two of those talked about reparations and one of those other things that's related to reparations. Oh, this fell. Okay. I want to tell you the story of Samuel Brown. Samuel Brown is a California resident. Spent 24 years in prison. Just released in the last year and a half or so. Samuel Brown was working inside of the prisons, not too far from here, actually. And he was, I believe, a custodian inside of the jails in the, in the prison. So he would go clean up the cells. That was his job. By the way, for that job, you're paid, I believe, 50 cents an hour. Literally 50 cents an hour. That's before taxes. Okay. Literally 
50 cents an hour before taxes. Samuel was told one day that, hey, go clean up this cell right here. The, the inmate, uh, he had COVID, and we need you to clean it up. And, you know, we need to make it real clean because, you know, that COVID thing is going on now. And Samuel said, I got, I got, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go in there because, you know, like, I might get sick and, you know, I got an existing health condition. It might make it worse. And they told him, listen, if you don't go in there and clean up that cell, when you go for parole, we're going to violate your parole. You have to stay here three, three more years. If you don't work, you can't leave. If you don't work, you can't leave. Samuel, being the brother that he is, called his wife you know, on the outside, said, baby, this is what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. She said, well, you need to do something about that. Why don't you write something and let's make a change? And from inside of his cell, Samuel Brown wrote what would become the first try at a law to make California end current slavery inside of California state prisons from his cell. The story doesn't end there, though. So Samuel gets out. We actually have had the pleasure of working with Samuel. I actually talked to Sam a few, a few days ago. Sam runs the, an organization called the California Abolition Act Coalition. He also runs something called the 10P program. Samuel is going back into the prison every single week to mentor the brothers in there. Okay? Right? But the story doesn't end there. So Samuel gets out. His, what he wrote is picked up by then Senator Sidney Kamlager, now U.S. Congresswoman Sidney Kamlager. And Senator Kamlager introduces Sam's language into the, to the state and says, listen, we want to make this a, a, a law. We actually want to put this on the ballot for everyday Californians to vote on. Do we want to end current slavery? Do we want to take that comma out and say no slavery, no involuntary servitude, there ain't no difference, get it all out of here? The state assembly said, yeah, we like that. The state senate said, no, no. We don't, we don't want to give Californians even the chance to stop that. And uh, I was, it was crazy. I was heartbroken. I mean, I, I think all of us were. It was last year in the summertime, the state senate did not have enough votes to end current slavery in California. So we have 40 senators. Only 20 voted to end current slavery, or rather, to give us the chance as voters to end current slavery. If we would have had that chance last year on our ballots, last November, we would have had, as oh, you know, you have like prop this and prop that, and prop. So prop is short for ballot proposition. So we would have had the chance last year as a ballot proposition to say whether or not you and me want to get rid of slavery in our state prisons. The state senate said, no, we don't even want to give y'all the chance. We want to keep it like it is. Well, I think my brother Chad here also said earlier, you know, as we, as we, we were fighting for the work to make our state see us as a specific group of people, we had a try and then we failed one time, but we tried again. And we tried again, and we actually made it happen. And, and I am happy to, I hope Sam doesn't get mad, uh, but it's going to be public on Wednesday anyway. I'm happy to announce that on Wednesday at the Capitol, and I'll be there, there will, there will be a press conference with hopefully the entire California Legislative Black Caucus, so all of the black legislators, to introduce the End Slavery in California Act, okay? Okay. okay. We're gonna get this done, okay? We are gonna get this done. Okay. I wanna say so much more, I do have to wrap up though. My friends, I wanna end with this. My brothers, my sisters, what will history say about you in this time?
What will it say? What will God say about you? God is calling you. Our ancestors are calling you. I'm calling you. The time is now. Will you answer? Put your hands up in the air. Repeat after me. <laughs> Reparations. 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 Thank you for your time. Thank you all so much for your patience. We just want to give Chris another big round of applause. Whew. Now y'all see why I'm so happy and proud of these young people. I think I'm probably the oldest person in the group. Uh, they call me Miss Nita. <laughs> I'm so old, they call me Miss Nita. But I thank God for each one of them. And at this time, I mean, last and certainly not least, Kanza Jones Muhammad, better known as Friday Jones, is a reparations advocate and educator. KJ, as we call her so tenderly, is the vice president of the Los Angeles Reparations Advisory Commission, appointed by former Mayor Eric Garcetti, president and co-facilitator of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, founding member of a coalition for a just and equitable California, the anchor organization for the California AB 3121 task force and former co-chair and founder, founding member of NAASDLA. KJ is the author and publisher of a self-help memoir, The Real Friday Jones. Y'all put your hands together for my sister. I call her bad mama jamma. She's a bad mama jamma, and we love her. Thank you, darling, for being here. We appreciate you. Okay, so, yeah, how do I end this thing? First of all, um, I want to give thanks to Pastor Chuck and Charlene Singleton. Thank you all so much for hosting us. Um, this is a beautiful facility, uh, and I'm so, so grateful to be here. I want to thank Nita. She put together a really beautiful program, and it shows. Um, and to all the people who spoke before me, Chris and I say this all the time. That's my brother from another mother and father, um, because we always think alike, and then I wind up following him, and I'm like, well, he already said who I want to thank. So for everyone who spoke, sincerely thank you. Um, we are modern day reparationists and we, we do this work with love. We really do. Um, I too am from a church home, so I feel like I need to recognize the church home I grew up in. I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, I came from Concord Baptist Church under Reverend Gardner C. Taylor. Um, Concord Baptist Church was born out of Abyssinian Baptist Church in, in the city in Manhattan, um, the oldest black church in New York. And a pastor came, Pastor Sampson came uh, to Brooklyn and, you know, there were plenty of white Baptist churches, but there was no church for the Negroes. And so it took about four pastors um, to start Concord Baptist Church. And just to give the perspective of time, that church was founded in 1847 in Brooklyn, New York. The church today is 174 years old. My great grandmother, up until she was about 102, uh, taught Sunday adult, not, yeah, Sunday adult Bible school. She died in 2012, she was 107 years old. So I just wanna give you, again, a little bit of um, perspective. Uh, and I want to take a minute now to talk a little bit about my family also, because I think sometimes in the fight and advocacy uh, for reparations, people think history lives in books and history lives in us. Um, my great grandmother is from a place called Scotland Neck, North Carolina. It's in Halifax County near Roanoke Rapids, which is on the Virginia state line. Um, her mother was actually sold into slavery uh, down to Mississippi, and 
her father, my great-great-grandfather, went down to Mississippi to get her. And she became free, just like that. Exchange of some money, her freedom was purchased. Um, my grandfather is from uh, the same place, Scotland Neck, and there's a little area called Caledonia. Uh, Caledonia is currently a prison, um, and Caledonia wound up being bestowed to some sharecroppers, and then the state decided that they didn't want the sharecroppers there anymore, and so they made a prison, and the prison to this day still grows its food. That is where my grandfather is from. Most of my family is buried in Scotland Neck, North Carolina, on my mother's side, my father's side of the family. My father, the Muhammad, comes from somewhere. Um, <laughs> he, he's made Hajj, God bless him. Um, he was an imam. He was a chaplain in Sing Sing Prison in New York. Um, my, father, uh, my father's father was dead before I was born, so I never got to meet my grandfather. However, my grandfather is a Spencer, and his mom was a Martin, and I come from one of the largest black families in the United States, the United Martin family, that can actually trace their ancestor to a bill of sale uh, here in the United States. It's, the family reunions are ridiculous. It's like 30,000 people. It's ridiculous. It's a very large family. Um, Tracy, and if you go to my website, and I didn't think to put it on here, but TheRealFridayJones.com, I wrote an open letter to Barack Obama, President, former President Barack Obama. And on that page, you can see the bill of sale um, for my ancestor. And that's a rare thing for people to have. Um, but we have it. And so I just want to read some words from her bill of sale. On July 1st, 1799, my great-grandmother Tracy arrived on America's shores from the country known today as Cameroon to be sold at the Charleston slave market at the age of 17 years old for 300 US dollars. She was originally purchased by a white woman, Bernadette Martin, the wife of Lewis Martin of Charleston, South Carolina. The language on this bill of sale reads, Tracy of the Congo Nation. To have and to hold the said Negro unto said Bernadette Martin for her sole use and benefit, her executors, administrators, and assigns to her in their own property use and behoof forever for her sole use and her heirs. Okay? In December of the same year, Tracy was subsequently sold to John Martin and planner from Fairfield uh, County, South Carolina, and his relative Robert Martin, a slave owner who would become my great-grandfather. This is American history, okay? I wanted to um, read that, and according to the family folklore, Tracy was actually a merchant in sub-Saharan Africa. We come from the Bamalike people. It's very rare for people to know that much about themselves, but for whatever reason, God made these people my family, and I'm here today to do this work, okay? Um, she spoke three languages, and that is why she was purchased. There is this misnomer somehow that, I don't know, people think that the people weren't people, that the people didn't do, that the people didn't understand commerce, that the people didn't understand how to till the earth, and none of that is true. And so I wanted to recognize my ancestors, both the slave owning ancestor, as well as uh, Tracy, who is like the matriarch of the United Martin family. Um, I also want to recognize uh, my grandmother, who is not what we would consider uh, a person who is a descendant of persons enslaved in the United States. My grandmother, her mom was a full blown Shinnecock Indian. The Shinnecock Nation is in. Uh, the Hamptons, what we know as the Hamptons on Long Island in New York. Uh, the family comes from a reservation. Um, they do have a treaty with the United States of America, and my great-grandfather uh, was a Fenty. He is from Barbados, and I like to say Rihanna and I are cousins because how many Fentys could there be in Barbados, right? So I just wanted to give that little bit of, of history because it's important for us to know. Um, 
our family's history and where we come from. You have an understanding of not just yourself, but you have an understanding of other people. Um, and it's important as we pursue our peoplehood in this country that we walk in the knowledge of who we are because it, it arms you and it prepares you to deal with those who are against you, okay? And now we can go to, I think I have a slide. I have some slides, I made some slides too. Um, the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants uh, is obviously a national org, that's why we put the word in the title. Um, we're a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and we are committed to advancing the national movement for compensatory reparations for black Americans who descend from U.S. chattel slavery. Um, we focus on essentially teaching. We teach Freedman history. I was beside myself with Dr. Bryan this morning teaching some of that history here. Uh, and we view our goals as being achieved through engagement, empowerment, and unity. And basically, we give people the tools um, to self-advocate. And what you saw here today, you saw Chris uh, from CJEC, and Chris actually helped me do this. We pulled a bunch of folks off of social media, and I was like, Chris, I'm going to run for office. I don't have time to do this. I need you to come in and help me figure this out. And Chris really came and uh, helped lay a sizable amount of the foundation for what we have today. And there were several ideations of, of how we would get to this point, but we finally arrived here. Um, and the work that we do has touched across the nation, and you'll see that. Next slide. This is a lovely letter. We'll skip this. Next slide. These are all the places thus far, and this list is growing, that through our national network, we have been able to either educate people, the municipal level, the state level, um, or the federal level, in the push for federal repair. So all down south, North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, Georgia, Tennessee, Texas, Illinois, Ohio. Um, Brooklyn, New York, I'll be in Albany next week talking to the state folks there, New Jersey, Silver Spring, Maryland, Vegas, and all of California. We just up and down California. Next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the different organizations that we have worked with over time. And I'm not going to name them all. They're up there. But they are representative of some of the other places that you saw in the last slide. Um, but these are the modern-day reparationists. Uh, we talked about our... Black Equity Institute, the Black Remembrance Project, um, Freedom, Freedmen Association of Chicago, the Canopy Collective, Solidarity, uh, Ohioans for Federal Reparations, um, the NAACP in San Fernando Valley. These are the people who are doing the work today. These are the people who are making their mark. These are the people who are, uh, what is the word? Coalition building with each other to get this job done. Next slide, please. <laughs> Municipalities. So at the national level, we really do believe in a three-pronged approach because that is what has been very effective here in California. We have the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants. We have CJEC, which is a coalition of essentially municipal bodies that still do reparations in their locale. And that three-pronged approach has really, really worked well for us. And these are the, the places we have either taught and or consulted with other advocates um, to make sure that they're following the pathway that California set. Next slide, please. Moguldom, I put them on the top. They're a little paper. Just, you know, uh, by Aishika, and I forget Aishika's last name. Um, she is someone at Moguldom who writes about everything that we do, any of these organizations. She writes about the experts. She writes about the different states and municipalities that come online. Um, she was recognized for an award at our uh, summit in Atlanta. But these media, uh, a lot of them, I don't know, black media, Moguldom, LA Sentinel, The Observer, um, WLBT, Epic Times. These are some of the media that has covered the work that we have done. Next slide. Harrison, Ashika Harrison, for the people in the Zoom. Next slide, please. 
So this was our inaugural summit, and you all heard from the incomparable Chair Camila Moore uh, from the California Reparations Task Force. We also had Dr. Weber, and we had John Tatiishi. Uh, we took a lot of flack for having John at our summit, but the one thing about the human experience is we do have the opportunity to learn from each other. And Japanese internment has been the national sort of standard for America actually taking a national uh, recognition of reparations and actually putting dollars to, to their legislation. And so we had him open up our summit in, in, in uh, Georgia. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the awards that were given out. And as you see, Chris did actually sort of clean up between him and CJ. And so we just want to recognize again, uh, Chris Logson, Fannie Lou Hamer Award. We, we tried to tie it to our past. Ida B. Wells uh, went to Politics in Black. That's a show I co-host. It's Friday Jones with Chad Brown. Um, the MLK Award for Outreach, CJ. Chris is an organizer's organizer. He is an organizer's organizer. He is an organizer's organizer. So if there's anybody here in Riverside that thinks they want to organize, you need to go talk to Chris Logson. Uh, the Frederick Douglass Award for Cultural Activism. Camila Moore has a hard job as the chair of the California Task Force. And so we recognized her. Um, Stella Award for support. There's always people that's behind the scenes. There's always people who are not in front of the camera. There are always people that are making sure that we stay in line. Crystal Gordon and Raphael Plunkett were those people. They were nominated. <laughs> Any photo that you see of NAASD uh, is typically coming from Raphael. She is a documentarian, and we have seen those photographers become the keepers of our history, and Raphael is one of those people. Um, the Selma Award for Courage went to the Freedmen of Chicago because <laughs> that is the, the ground of conflict where reparations is concerned on a national level. And those people in Chicago stayed on the Freedmen pathway and really focused on the descendants and not trying to make reparations into a cure-all like affirmative action. And so we recognized them. The Wilmington Award for Excellence in Organization, again, the organizer's organizer, CJ. Ferguson Award for Discipline and Purpose, the U.S. Freedmen Project, and I will stop here for a second to talk about them. They are based in New York. The last, I want to say two years, there has been an attempt to put reparations legislation through at the state level. The problem was California, because California set a bar for the focusing the priority on the descendant community. And so I've worked with them. Chris has worked with them. And next week I'll be in Albany with them at their Black, Puerto Rican, Haitian, Asian, and Pacific Islander caucus. And I'll be telling them the same story I told you about the same people, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, all them same people. I will go there and I will tell them. I will tell them that I went to Concord Baptist Church. I will tell them that Concord Baptist Church sent me to Christian camp up in upstate New York at Sunshine Acres Christian Camp. I'll tell them that I went to Juma on Friday with my dad because he was Muslim and that's what we do. I'll share the same stories and I will tell them that they need to understand that the legislation that is being asserted by uh, Assemblywoman Nikki Lucas, who is the borough, pres the borough state senator, uh, for Brooklyn, that that legislation is the right legislation. And it's the right legislation because we took the people from California, we looked at how much money California spent, we looked at some of the shortcomings in terms of no real allocation of marketing dollars or education dollars so that communities could see billboards plastered to even know that the AB3121 task force was happening. We took some of the early recommendations of the task force, including a need for New York Freedmen's Bureau, and we put it in the bill. We said, this is what we learned. So we educated the next state coming online, and because, yeah, I am from Brooklyn, and I may have been living here for a long time, but I have family still there. 
my grandmother, my, my excuse me, my great grand, everybody except for me, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother lived in Kingsborough Projects. Kingsborough Projects was one of the black projects. And so when Levittown started being built out in Long Island and our great federal government gave money to those builders and developers and allowed them to not write black people in, my great grandmother left Kingsborough Projects when she was 102 years old. And she went into Concord Baptist Church's um, senior home. So I'm vested in New York, in case y'all couldn't tell. The Gary Award for mentoring and development went to Dr. Uh, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen. They are the husband-wife duo that wrote From Here to Equality, which is considered by us a staple Bible reading for reparations. They have spent countless hours not just talking to the folks that you've met here today, but they speak at seminars there across this country, ripping and, and trailblazing, talking to anyone and everyone who wants to hear about pure reparations for the descendants of persons enslaved in these here United States. And last but not least, the Watts Award for Resiliency uh, went to abolish slavery. And abolish slavery was Sam Brown that you heard Chris talk about. Next slide, please. Next slide. The Repair Act. So a lot of times you hear people say, oh, we don't know what to do. We don't know what legislation looks like. That is where NAASD comes in. We teach those things. We have online trainings. We have online trainings for people who actually want to run for office. We want to get how we're talking to these different legislators, whether they are state or municipal, we want to start talking to them in the same way so that we can start moving things, not just here in California, but we can move things in Chicago, we can move things in New York. We can move things in Scotland Neck, North Carolina, that has a main street and 2,500 people. I went to a larger high school than the town where I'm from. But I keep going back because to me, that's where it really is. There was a slide up here that talked about how we are somewhat disconnected um, from like the state of black America. I make sure I stay connected. I, I know where I'm from and I go back to where I'm from. I go back to the, the burial site that was started by a woman named Mary Barnes. I thought growing up that Mary's Chapel was Mary Mother Jesus, right? You would think Mary's Chapel, that's, that's Jesus' mama's church. That's her church. That is not her church. Mary Barnes, a former enslaved woman, had an inheritance when her daughter died, and she built a black church and a black cemetery because the black people couldn't be buried where the white people were buried. And that is where my family is buried. So I go to pay homage to my family. The Repair Act, we drafted this body of work in 2019. This is our presidential priorities. If you go to naasd.org, you can click on the Repair Act and you can read some of these things. But these were 10, 10, 12 things we told President Biden, you could do these things by executive order. Um, and I'm just gonna give the top three. So we wrote our own reparations commission. We paid tribute to John Conyers. We wrote truth and reconciliation hearing. We got that from Barbara Lee. She's California, Northern California. She wrote it for like all of America's ills. We said, no, we're going to keep it on the freedmen's ills, on the black people. We wrote that. And then we have um, this President's Advisory Commission um, by executive order. And somewhere on here is the Freedmen's Bureau. And I just want to talk about those two things. The Asian Pacific Islander community went to Barack Obama and said, hey, we're underrepresented. We need to see what government has going on so we can get in here and we can participate. Well, we said, well, we want to do the same thing. President Biden hasn't signed that initiative yet. But the Asian Pacific Islanders did get it out of the Democratic Party. The Freedmen's Bureau, um, I don't know how many of you ever read the veto speech that uh, Johnson gave when he vetoed it. But one of the things that we kind of honed on into, 
It's like the last thing he said. It's almost the second to last paragraph in this page's long speech. And he said that basically he was vetoing it. He didn't want redress going to freedmen outside of what they would be entitled to as American citizens. And he said that once, if it doesn't work, if this thing that I do doesn't work, the president has the ability to bring it back. So we said, bring it back, President Biden. If the president that took it away said that another president could bring it back, we said, bring it back. And more importantly, he knew we weren't going to get redress. We've tried in, in this country to get redress for reparations under Cowley House, and I think his name was Isaiah Dickerson, uh, the ex-slave pension movement. The ex-slave pension movement ended in 1933. Again, my great-grandmother died in 2012, and she was 107 years old. My grandmother is 94. She'll be 95 this year. She lives with me. Uh, I'm going to move on because I got stuck, but... The point with the Freedmen's Bureau, oh, three branches of government. We weren't given redress at, at the court level. We still see our farmers losing at, at the, the court level. We were not given redress through Cowley House and Isaiah Dickerson, ex-slave pension movement through Congress. And then the president is the last course of action. We haven't had any president bring redress. And so we have three levels of government. That's basic civics. We have three levels of government. All three levels of America's government has said no to this group of people. And we are here to address that. Next slide. This is us at our conference and our summit there in Texas. This is the team that put it all together. Here's Raphael, who got that award. We did that thing. It was very nice. It was at the national... Uh, what is that, human, human, national, human and Civil Rights Museum that had a Martin Luther King installation. It was a beautiful facility. Next slide. These are the members of our board. Mark Stevenson is my vice president, but he's my co-facilitator. We have Tiffany, Quarles, Lori Jenkins, and Michael Brown. Uh, we have a new secretary, uh, Najee Jahan. Uh, this is the team, the national team, that makes things happen. <laughs> Next slide. Says our names again. No, some more people. And in summary, you could, we're done. Um, in summary, I just want to say, you know, if you're trying to figure out how you may be able to bring something like this to Riverside, you know, churches are in a little bit of a precarious situation, kind of like, 501c3s, and one of the things that I say when I go talk to funders who want to understand how they should be adding to their portfolio, reparations is so hot topic now, it's part of a portfolio from funders. If you want to really repair this country, you can't lock people into 501c3 that can't do political work. You are going to have to write the check for 501c4s that can do political work. You are going to have to write a check for PACs that can put money behind candidates that actually have a reparations platform. You're going to have to put money behind parties, political parties, that are not the Democratic Party, that are not the Republican Party. The two-party system is failing. You're going to have to create a party system that actually allows us to get people into our local offices in particular that understand the need for redress for this community and body of people. Um, that, I think, is all I have, Ms. Nita. Uh, NAASD.org. You are welcome to, to look us up, sign up for the newsletter. If you're looking for a place to just, you know, do some coalition building, we're that body that can do it. For people who may be online, if you're looking to figure out how to start this um, legislative writing process, we can help you with that. Uh, our largest accomplishment will be the Full Repair Act, which we will be releasing uh, to run in the 2024 election cycle. I like to say we are the educators 
We won't right, do the lobbying because we can't because we're 501c3 and we play by the rules, but we will certainly teach people that want to learn. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I told y'all, I told you that this was an amazing group of civil rights activists and reparationists, and we appreciate them all today. We're going to have our illustrious pastors come up and close us out. Pastor Chuck and Pastor Charlene, please. Thank you for opening your doors, your beautiful church. It's awesome every time. We appreciate you. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, this has been so fantastic. And Nita Watson, once again, we said it before. Thank you. Top of the rock. Pull it together. Thank you for the team, Rochelle, Bryant, and uh, Uncle Jerry. <laughs> That's a new one. I hadn't heard that one before. Uncle Jerry. I call him J-Bone. Um, all of the speakers, my goodness, it's just been rich, so full. And we, we recorded this with Nita's guidance and with your permission. We want our other members of our church to be able to see it and other people in the community. And others in the community are already watching. I got, I got text messages before we started, even while we were starting, from other pastors in the community, uh, Pastor Terry Starks, Pastor uh, Ray Turner, I'm going to forget somebody, Ray Turner from San Bernardino at Temple Baptist Church, uh, Pastor Terry Starks from Riverside Rubido Missionary Baptist Church uh, is on right now watching and participating in this. And, uh, and then Pastor Washington and his wife were here and they headed back out to uh, Lancaster. Uh, so it's been fantastic. You guys have just been amazing. Wow. And the food yes. was good. Yes. Amen. Well, we're just going to have our, our closing prayer. You going to say something? Well, really quick to those that um, are just learning about this reparations. I praise God for Anita, Jerry, Rochelle. I was telling Anita today, I can't believe that I'm just really getting into this, but I am so grateful. But what I said to Anita was, um, you may not get there when you want to, when, when, you should, when you could have, but it's never too late. So for those that are watching, I know that God stirred a whole lot of things in a lot of people's hearts. I know for me, this last week has been just a truly a true education. And even on my show uh, this last Sunday, uh, Pastor Chuck and I talked about this reparations. Um, the Charlene Singleton Show, it's on Loveland Church um, YouTube, lovelandchurch.org. And we're actually going to put together, uh, edit this video. I've already talked to the guys to edit this from tonight to put up next week so people can, yeah, so people can continue to get an education on this. So I know we're all ready to go, but once again, thank you for everybody that uh, participated because we know one person doesn't do this by themselves, but it takes vision. And I tell people all the time, if you think you're a leader and nobody's following, then you're not a leader. But for Anita and all of you all, people are following. Praise God for your leadership. Amen. Amen. Well, this nation and really the European world, including this nation, has had four big historic opportunities to fix this. The first one was right at the revolution. There were really people, and some of those founders even express sentiments, which we have in writing, to get rid of slavery at the founding, 1776. Second opportunity came with the Civil War. Reconstruction would have fixed it, would have fixed it if they didn't let these folks fool them out of it. Third came with the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King, and all of us who work with it. The fourth one is right now. Let's get it done. 
Amen. Uh, I have a book coming out in June that will tell you more about that in case you're interested. But we really had all, all these historians that have already been talking about it. It's pretty amazing. Let's all stand. Uh, Dr. Brown, so grateful, my good friend, good brother, that he could be a part of this discussion. William Darity as well, a great friend and brother who couldn't be here in person, but they've done an excellent, excellent job. All right. Well, so we're going to pray. We're in a church. It's all right if we pray, isn't it? <laughs> all right, we go. So uh, you can do one of two things. Lift up your head. I, you know, well, I, can't, I can't help it. I got to say, so many of you shared. I grew up in church. You said I, I went to church. And then to hear Concord at the end where I spoke years ago. But so great to see you coming up and your grandmother saying, about time. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Father. What a great God you are. You're doing this. Nita said it several times. You're doing this. This great injustice, 400 year old injustice. You're bringing it out. You're using these people standing around this room, these people who've spoken to us. You're using this group to straighten out a great, great, great injustice because you are the God of justice. Fix this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.